You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino-style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day, lo. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BGW group. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Hello everyone, and welcome to History of the Great War, episode 207. This week, I would like to thank Gregory for his donation through PayPal and then his support through Patreon. And I'd also like to thank Christine for the support through PayPal. You can head on over to patreon.com slash history of the great war to find out how you can gain access to special ad free versions of all the normal episodes of the podcast, as well as special members only episodes. That's patreon.com slash history of the great war to find out more. In the aftermath of the first world war, many new nations would be created out of the old empires of Europe. One of those nations would be Poland. Poland had a long history of independence and also a long history of being attacked and partitioned by its larger neighbors. Many times throughout history, either the Prussians, the Austrians, or the Russians, or all of them at once, had attacked Poland in wars of conquest. During the years after the First World War, Russia, led by the Communists, would once again try to conquer Polish territory. In the war that followed, known as the Polish-Soviet War, fighting would be brutal, with both sides executing prisoners and terrorizing the countryside. The fighting would move hundreds of kilometers first east, then back west, and then east again, as the fortunes of war swung first one way and then the other, and then one way and then the other. For the Poles, this was a war for survival, and for the Red Army, it was just the first step in their plan to spread the revolution into the west. It would eventually lead to two important changes in the European political landscape. The first was that Poland fully asserted itself as an independent country, one that was capable of defending itself, ensuring its independence for at least the foreseeable future. The second was that, with the defeat of the Red Army at the gates of Warsaw, the communist leaders of Russia would alter their views on the global revolution that they had previously hoped to lead. Using the Red Army as a revolutionary vanguard to first move into Eastern Europe and then Germany had always been the plan. But the defeat at the hands of the Poles made it clear that this path was no longer open to communism. Discussing the events that led to these changes will be our topic for the next six episodes. Today I will lay some groundwork with an overview of the developments in Poland during and after the First World War, followed by a discussion of how the Western powers responded to Polish calls for aid. This episode will end with a discussion about the military forces available to Poland at the start of the conflict. I will just say on a personal note that of all the topics that I've covered in this podcast since I'd barely heard of its existence, the Polish-Soviet War probably surprised me the most in terms of how much I enjoyed learning about it and how important it is to modern European history. During the First World War, both sides used Polish nationalism to their own gains. The Entente was in a bit of a tight spot in terms of responding to this nationalism. The British and French probably would have supported the Poles, but with so much territory under Russian control in 1914, expressing that support was impossible. This allowed the Germans and Austrians to be the outspoken supporters of Polish nationalists everywhere. They would use this position both before and during the war to garner support from the Poles. The most prominent person in our story that would utilize this support to catapult himself into a position of leadership of the Polish independence movement was Joseph Pilsudski. Pilsudski was born in 1867 and would eventually lead Poland through the period of its war with Russia, but first he led a paramilitary unit in the Austro-Hungarian army. 
The Austrian leaders realized, over a decade before the First World War, that it could use the passion of the Polish people in a conflict with Russia. To do so, they created a Polish legion, made up primarily of Polish men from Russian territory. In the event of a conflict, they would then attack into Russian-held Polish territory. From the very beginning, the Austrians gave at least lip service to some form of Polish independence after an Austro-Russian conflict. In 1914, everything would go pretty much precisely to plan, and Polish forces led by Pilsudski and others would move into Russian territory. The war in the East was so successful for the Central Powers that after two years of war, vast areas of Polish territory were under Austrian and German control. This was actually in some ways problematic for the two countries because it required them to make actual promises and to show actual results for the Polish people. The Germans would attempt to do so through the creation of the Kingdom of Poland, and they were incredibly vague on what that actually meant. The precise borders, leadership, and relationship with other countries that the new kingdom would have were all unanswered questions. Really, the Germans just wanted to use the concept of a kingdom to bring Polish men into their armies. The Austrians just did not want to answer any questions about the future of Poland. Not because Austrian leaders did not know what they planned to do, but instead because they knew that Polish nationalists who were fighting for them would not like any of the answers that they could give. All of this uncertainty would lead some Poles to reject the Germans and Austrians, and Pilsudski would be among them. For his refusal to swear an oath of friendship to Germany, he would be imprisoned for the last two years of the war. This period of imprisonment, while I'm sure it was uncomfortable, would actually aid Pilsudski's eventual rise to leadership in Poland due to it cementing his nationalist credentials. The same day that the armistice was signed in the West, the German occupation of Poland started to come to an end. The German troops would evacuate, creating a power vacuum that would have to be filled. The vacuum caused disorder and chaos in some places, like Ukraine, but in Poland it was seen as a gift to be utilized to create a new Polish state. Pilsudski was released from prison, and just a few days later he would declare to the Allies that Poland had been reformed. Official recognition for this new nation would not arrive until February 1919, but that did not prevent the Poles from sending a delegation to the Paris Peace Conference. When they arrived, they found that they had very solid support from many Western countries, but this support was skewed in a very specific direction. In regards to all of the questions around Poland and its north, west, and southern borders, there were many opinions in Paris. The leaders were also willing to help resolve any differences between Poland and the new countries springing up in the wake of the disintegration of Austria-Hungary. At times, they would resolve these differences in, that involved detailed arguments and the adjustment of borders of just a few miles or even less, one way or another. However, the one area where the Western countries were not willing to spend the time to create a real settlement was in the East. They were unwilling to put in the time to find a settlement, and crucially more unwilling to guarantee its acceptance by military action if necessary. It would not have been easy, with both Poland and Russia believing in very different borders even as a starting point for negotiations, and the leadership of Russia was still in flux, the civil war was still raging. These challenges would prove to be unfortunate for the new Polish state. It did not help that the Russians believed that in attacking Poland, they were attacking a puppet of the Western countries and the Versailles Treaty as a whole. Lenin would say, quote, By attacking Poland, we are attacking the Allies. By destroying the Polish army, we are destroying the Versailles Peace, upon which rests the whole present system of international relations. This additional reason just added extra excuses for the eventual Russian attack, and added urgency to the Polish calls for aid. While there were certain topics that the Western nations would not commit to, like the eastern borders of Poland, France still considered relations with Poland to be absolutely critical for future national security. The relationship between the two countries would be strained, but the defensive concerns of both would keep the relationship together. The French believed that Polish territorial claims were much larger than they should expect to receive, a disagreement which was particularly problematic in 1919, when the French were still supporting both the Whites and the Poles in any fighting against the Reds. If the Whites did eventually win, it probably would have resulted in more fighting due to their statements about a united, undivided Russia. This would never really come to pass, though, because of how badly the White cause would go in late 1919. 
The Polish leaders would con constantly feel that the French were far too interested in the Polish situation, but not nearly helpful enough. The French would try to control the situation from afar, including Polish military campaigns through military missions and advisors, but they would not provide the mini material to really justify such control. In December 1919, Polish representatives in Paris had discussed their plans for an attack to be launched in 1920 with the French general staff. There were several different mindsets within the French government. There was one group that wanted to temper Polish goals, especially as it related to the Ukraine, which France was at that time trying to build better relations with. Another group, led by Prime Minister Millerand, uh, saw the Poles as the best way to control Bolshevik expansion. This group wanted to make sure that the Poles were in no way discouraged from their desire for greater territorial acquisitions, and in fact those desires should be nurtured and encouraged. The third group of French leaders was still more cautious, with their primary concern being that a Polish attack could lead to defeat and disaster. The climax of the French efforts would be the French military mission that would be present during the actions around Warsaw, a mission, a mission that planned to play a critical role in guiding the defense, and which the Poles barely listened to. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options, or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com GW50 to get 50% off. Freedom is all about choices, and while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild in style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xe. Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the open-air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xe, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power retail sales data, Jeep is a registered trademark. The one question I've not really answered is why the French cared as much as they did about Poland. While many French leaders saw Poland as the key to the entirety of the Treaty of Versailles, and if the new country fell to the Communists, then the treaty would be, have to be drastically changed. In late 1919, Poland was the bulwark behind which the rest of Europe could rest easy, not having to worry about Bolshevik attacks. The most important of the countries that were hiding behind this bulwark was Germany. Germany had been almost entirely disarmed by the Treaty of Versailles. Its army was reduced to barely enough to maintain internal security, and most of its military hardware had been confiscated. If Poland should fall to the communists and the Red Army appear on the German border, this military situation would have to change. The Germans would insist on revisions, and the French and British would have to allow them to rearm, and to begin again the process of military expansion. The only other option was to send their own military forces into Germany to fight the Red Army advance. The idea of sending French and British troops into Germany or Eastern Europe was rejected by most French leaders. Even the most aggressive members of the military, like Marshal Foch, would say that committing French troops to Eastern Europe would, quote, set in motion a course of advance the consequences of which are incalculable. With the possibility of committing large numbers of French troops into the fighting having been rejected, the only hope was to trust to the Polish defenses. The only thing that the French could provide were weapons, supplies, and military missions to provide technical assistance. What the Poles wanted, and precisely what they would not get, were large numbers of French troops. 
While the French were trying to determine their commitment to Polish security, in London a very different conversation was occurring. Lloyd George had been concerned about the ability of Poland to defend itself since the Paris Peace Conference had started in early 1919. He had raised concerns when certain territorial decisions had been made, like in the creation of the Danzig Corridor. These concerns were based around a simple question. Quote, should the populations of these areas rise against the Poles, and should their fellow countrymen wish to go to their assistance, would France, Great Britain, and the United States go to war to maintain Polish rule over them? If the answer to this question was no, then the Western countries had given the Poles a liability that they were not prepared to assist them with if needed. Lloyd George believed that the Poles were preparing to introduce a whole new set of liabilities if they continued on their path of expansion in the East. If they expanded, confronted the Russians, and failed, Lloyd George believed that the Allies might get pulled into the fighting as it reached Germany, which was basically the worst possible outcome. Among British politicians, there was growing support to, instead of supporting the Poles in a war, to try and rebuild relations with Russia and the Communists, especially in the realm of trade relations. This change to a more conciliatory approach was only made after it became clear that a military confrontation with the communists was unlikely to end in success. In a cabinet meeting, Lloyd George would say, quite rightly, that there can be no question of making active war on the Bolsheviks, for the reason that we have neither the men, the money, nor the credit, and public opinion is altogether opposed to such a course. Even if these feelings had not been prevalent in the British government, it's unlikely that they would have been able to play an active role in the fighting in Poland. 1920 was a time of great unrest on the British home front. The labor unions and the labor party were agitating for changes, and they were strongly against any British actions against Russia. Many within the labor party believed that the Bolsheviks were bringing with them socialism around the world, a change that they hoped would improve the situation in Britain and all of Western Europe. Because of these views, they were deeply troubled by the interventionist rhetoric that was being used by the British government in late 1919. In early 1920, even after Lloyd George declared that his government was attempting to reopen trade with Russia, they were still very wary. Over the course of the Polish-Soviet War, and as the Polish fortunes declined with the Russian advance towards Warsaw, the British labor groups felt that they had to speak out in stronger and stronger language and greater resolve. On August 5th, the Council of Action was created with the expressed purpose of uniting and organizing the workers to prevent any British intervention in Poland. While diplomacy with the Western countries was important, there were other areas of foreign relations that were also critical to Poland in the early months and years of its existence. Relations with two countries would be at the top of that list, Czechoslovakia and Lithuania. I will hold off on Lithuania for now, due to the critical role that it will play in later episodes, but at the moment I will just discuss relations with Czechoslovakia. In theory, the Poles and Czechs were perfectly positioned allies. They shared a border and were both bordered by much larger powers, Germany for Czechoslovakia and both Germany and Russia for Poland. However, they could never really find their path to an agreement, even a defensive alliance. There was support for ver from various groups on both sides, with Czech statesman Mezariak saying that they were, quote, forced to form a defensive alliance not only because of the geographic situation, but by the command of history. The political arithmetic has brought the two Western Slavic nations to conclude an alliance for life and death. The biggest roadblock, though, to this cooperation was the territorial disagreements on the shared border between the two countries. This was focused on a small area of Silesia, which was important due to its coal fields and industrial capacity. There would even be fighting in the area, which would only end after a ruling from the Allies in Paris. It would only be after the Russian threat had receded in the early 1920s that the two countries would be able to come together, and even that brief period of cooperation would soon come to an end. While the feelings of various countries around Europe and their views of Poland were important, with the almost inevitable confrontation with communist Russia on the horizon, the Polish military would take center stage. When Pilsudski formed the Polish state in late 1918, the country had an army that was made up of just three regiments of what had been Polish units in foreign armies. In total, there were about 9,000 men. After November, this number began to quickly expand, most of it due to further Polish veterans coming in from the surrounding nations. 
Polish volunteers flooded in from areas like Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Russia, which were all either disbanded, greatly reduced in size, or had served states that no longer existed. From further afield would come 50,000 troops from France, led by General Haller. These men, which made up a unit called the Blue Army, had been waiting in France for this very moment, after being formed in 1917. They had been gathered from Polish prisoners of war camps, which had been serving uh, in either the German or Austrian armies, and they were very well trained and equipped by the Western Allies. All of these soldiers, after they arrived, allowed the Polish army to field 110,000 soldiers in February 1919. It would be at that point that the new Polish parliament would pass laws that formalized the creation of the army, and over the next few months it would continue to expand up to about 170,000. To try and sustain this level of growth and equip the ever-expanding force meant almost half of the budget of Poland was poured into the army. Beyond the fiscal responsibility of paying for the army, such a rapid expansion and particularly the bringing together of disparate units from around Europe would cause problems. The first problem was that while all of the soldiers were Polish, they all had drastically different backgrounds. Many had just came out of a war where they had been fighting one another. They all had separate identities, with the Polish soldiers of the Blue Army having a very different mindset than those that had served in the Russian army during the First World War. This caused friction between units, and it caused problems when trying to integrate replacements and reinforcements into various units. There were also almost impossibly complex problems in the supply. The equipment available to the Polish army was a grab bag of World War I surplus items. Russian, British, German, Austrian, French, Canadian, rifles, munitions, and spare parts were all available and in use in various units of the army. This obviously became problematic when it came to making sure the right units got the right types of ammunition. This flow of ammunition to each individual unit was critical because it was often impossible for one unit to help supply another if ammunition did not get through because they might have completely different weapons. Over time, this would become less a problem if only due to the masses of allied surplus arms that flooded into the country as the western nations demobilized. But at the beginning, it was a colossal headache for Polish staff officers. And there was really nothing that the Polish leaders could do to reduce the problem in the short term. They just had to wait until they got more rifles. While the weapons given to the infantry were a wide variety of make and model, there was similar confusion in the artillery. In 1919, you could find Canadian howitzers, Italian mountain guns, and French guns dating back to the late 1800s all present in the Polish army. Resupply was just as big of a problem as it was in the infantry, and if a battery lost its guns or they broke down and they couldn't be re uh, replaced, there was the additional problem of retraining the gunners on the different pieces of artillery that they now had to operate. It was partially due to this fractured supply situation that the cavalry would play such an important role during the Polish-Soviet conflict. The cavalry units that would see the most action were what I would refer to as classical cavalry, relying on the lance and the saber instead of rifles and machine guns. Both the Polish army and the Russians would heavily utilize cavalry in this way, aided by the vast distances over which the fighting would occur. In this environment, the cavalry would find the kind of welcoming environment that was so rare during the 20th century. While the Polish army was being created from almost nothing, and then expanded during 1919, the communists were fighting for the future of Russia in Siberia and southern Russia. But at the same time, both countries were already on the path to confrontation, due to the situation in the border areas between them. After the retreat of the German troops in late 1918, there were vast areas between the region of Polish control in the west and the area of stable communist control in the east. These borderlands would be claimed by both countries, but controlled by neither. The Russians could not assert their control due to the Red Army being committed to chasing down the Whites. The Polish army was busy fighting the Czechs and guarding against German aggression in Silesia. However, as all of the other fronts settled down during late 1919 and early 1920, the number of troops in the border area began to increase rapidly, making a clash between the two armies inevitable. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode as we continue our story of the Polish-Soviet War.